Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to HR Profiles webinar on the FCRA. Are your employment screening and background checks fair for your applicants? A simple and easy solution to ensure fair hiring practices. Now, I have to throw in a disclaimer to let you know that we are counsel and what we say is not legal advice. We can help you explain the guidelines, uh, but if you want legal advice, you will have to consult your attorney. Some quick webinar info before we begin. If you need anything during the presentation, please let me know by typing it in the chat box or raising your hand. If you have a question about something that was just said, write the question in the Q&A box and we'll have some time at the end to answer all of your questions. Anything that doesn't get answered during that time, we'll be sure to follow up with you personally and make sure that your question gets answered. Now, what do Whole Foods, Dollar General, Kmart, Walt Disney, what do they all have in common? They have all violated federal guidelines when it comes to hiring. These guidelines apply to your company too, whether you're familiar with the laws or not. Kmart settlement was four million dollars. Dollar General settled for three million dollars. Can your company withstand a lawsuit from applicants as a result of uninformed hiring? When it comes to following the guidelines set forth by the FCRA, there is no difference between your company and a Fortune 500 company. This presentation will help you understand the basics regarding the FCRA and how it applies to your company. I am Jane McFadden, HR Profiles Client Advocate. I focus on educating our clients and prospects to help them stay up to date with what's going on in the HR industry. Your concierge, if you will, giving our clients their deserved extra and personalized attention. People are wearing more hats and are responsible for more now than they ever have been before. So we aim to be that resource when you have a hiring or compliance question. John Robinson is HR Profiles Compliance Officer here with me today. He is well versed in the current regulations and congressional movements surrounding these federal requirements. He and our on-site attorney work very hard to keep our practices, forms, and policies up to date. They study and research to make sure that we keep our clients compliant with the latest laws and regulations. John will get into the nitty-gritty details of the law, and then I'll follow up at the end with some action steps of what we can do right away to make sure that you are compliant. Thank you, Jane, and thanks for attending today. As it relates to background checks for employment purposes. This has been a hot topic among employers and their HR staff for good reasons. Large employers have become targets of litigation for FCRA-based class action claims. I will briefly touch upon some of these cases throughout the web webinar to highlight FCRA compliance er errors. And this is not meant to criticize these companies, but to be a learning experience for you. At the conclusion of the webinar, you'll understand what the FCRA is and how it regulates you as an employer. You will learn clear guidelines for FCRA compliance and we'll cover any questions you may have. One misnomer when it comes to the FCRA is that it only applies to the big three credit bureaus or when someone applies for credit. Now, this was true when the law came into existence, but it actually covers many different types of consumer reports. For instance, criminal records, driving records, employment verification, education verification, etc. And those susceptible to violations of the FCRA include the credit bureaus, as well as data furnishers, consumer reporting agencies, or CRAs, employers, and landlords. You might not know this, but prior to 1970, if you applied for a loan or mortgage and you were denied, you as a consumer had no way to contest or challenge the denial. You had no right to review your consumer report. The company wasn't required to show you the report or even give you a reason for the denial. The FCRA was created to bring fairness to the consumer and allow for a fair shake at obtaining what they applied for. 
As a result, the FCRA was enacted in 1970 to regulate the collection, assembly, and use of consumer report information to protect consumers from misinformation or mistakes in the public record. The FCRA has been updated many times since it was first enacted and it expanded to include insurance, tenancy, and employment. The focus of today's webinar will be on employment screening and the requirements for employers as we call them end users of consumer reports. As an employer, you don't want to be the one who doesn't know the law. You're going to be held accountable for your actions, so learn the law and know your responsibilities. You don't want to end up like one of the companies we mentioned in the introduction. So, what is the FCRA and who does it regulate? The FCRA is a federal law that regulates the use of personal information by private businesses. Simply put, the FCRA is a federal consumer protection statute. It imposes a minimum standard on employers when conducting background checks. However, Depending on your state, you may have to comply with more stringent regulations. The FCRA regulates furnishers, which are commonly known as CRAs, credit reporting agencies. HR profile is a CRA. And the FCRA regulates end users, the users of consumer reports, in this case, you as the employer. The FCRA gives consumers protections and rights, and in this instance, your applicants. Why you've all tuned in today is because you want to know what is the end user's responsibility when procuring a consumer report and complying with the FCRA. End users have four primary duties. They are permissible purpose, certification to the CRA, disclosure and authorization, and adverse action. Before running a consumer report or background check, the employer must certify they will follow all steps set steps set forth in the Fair Credit Reporting Act, including that the employer will use the information for employment purposes only. The employer will not use the information in violation of any federal or state equal opportunity law. The employer will obtain all necessary disclosure and consent. The employer will give appropriate notices in the event that an adverse action is taken against an applicant based in whole or in part on the contents of the consumer report. For our clients, our welcome aboard kit you received before we ran any searches informs you of these four duties and provides the necessary compliant paperwork for you, for you to use to obtain a consumer report. This kit includes a lot of information, but all the documents and information are required for compliance under the FCRA. The service agreement satisfies the permissible purpose and certification components under the FCRA when submitting our forms. Also included in the Welcome Aboard Kit is the important disclosure form, the employment profile form for authorization, and an adverse action information kit along with the summary of consumer rights. Now the, the remainder of the webinar will focus on the last two duties of the end user, disclosure and authorization, and adverse action. These two items are the basis for the majority of the FCRA lawsuits involving employers. I believe your hiring process can be made easier by following five simple steps. These steps are disclosure, authorization, pre-adverse action, waiting a reasonable period of time, or I like to call the pause, and adverse action. For those attending who are already using our service, you will recognize our forms. Those of you who are not using our service, you should have an equivalent or similar form provided by your current CRA. The first step to follow FCRA compliance is to inform the applicant that a consumer report or background check is going to be run on them. Step one, disclosure. The applicant must be informed that a consumer report or background check is going to be obtained. The applicant needs to understand that the information will be used in making a hiring decision. It is important not to bury the disclosure in your application. HR profile important disclosure form that is to be given to the applicant generally before completing the employment profile form. The public's class action lawsuit sent around this very issue, accusing the supermarket chain of violating the FCRA 
by failing to provide potential workers with a so-called standalone disclosure during their application process. Step two, authorization. Make sure you get written consent or authorization from the applicant to obtain the consumer report by having the applicant complete the employment profile form. To work here at HR Profile, we have all potential applicants complete a standard application, important disclosure form, and the employment profile form. This seems pretty straightforward, but it becomes more of an issue when the employer combines the disclosure and authorization and a release of liability on the same page or including additional language or they incorporate the disclosure and authorization into their actual application. The Domino's case is a perfect example of this. They settled a class action lawsuit that alleged Domino's pre-employment background investigation and consent form was non-compliant. Even though on the top of the form it said background investigation and consent form, which some would argue was clearly obvious, but it was in the actual application. So the procurement of the consumer report was non-compliant on the basis that the form was not clear and conspicuous because it was buried within the applicant application, which violated the FCRA. Now, some attorneys are making the argument that employers should have everything on its own page until better clarification is handed down from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB, who has remained largely silent on this issue. As a best practice, HR Profile recommends having a separate disclosure and authorization forms. These first two steps, disclosure and authorization, are absolutely required for FCRA compliance. The disclosure and authorization forms must be executed and signed by the applicant prior to requesting or conducting a background check. Once you get the consumer report, you may or may not have additional steps to take to comply with the FCRA. You'll have to ask yourself, does this consumer report have any disqualifying information on it? This will be determined by your company's hiring policy. Make sure your company does not have any blanket policies. An example of this would be not hiring any person with any type of criminal conviction. Each position should have their own requirements based on job relatedness and business necessity to comply with the EEOC enforcement guidance. We sponsored a Taft law firm who gave a presentation on this very topic during our last webinar. I highly recommend reviewing this webinar for further information. You can email Jane and she can send you the link to the video or you can find it on our website under the events and webinars page. There is a big difference between derogatory and disqualifying information on a consumer report and sometimes in the industry we use these words interchangeably. But let me be clear. Just because someone's consumer report comes back with derogatory information, that doesn't necessarily mean you won't be hiring them. For example, if your applicant was convicted of a minor offense seven years ago, that doesn't relate to the job at hand and you don't consider it a disqualifying event you can hire that person, nothing further needs to be done, now that the consumer report has come back with no disqualifying information on it. You have done your due diligence with disclosure and authorization and have successfully followed the FCRA. Let's go over that again. When you get the consumer report back, you as an employer must, you, you must ask yourself, was information found that would disqualify the applicant from working within your company? If your answer is no, you can hire the applicant. If the answer is yes, there is disqualifying information on the consumer report, then there are additional steps that need to be taken to comply with the FCRA called adverse action. Adverse action is the last three steps of FCRA compliance, but only if you decide not to hire the applicant based in whole or in part on the information contained in the consumer report that your company policy deems disqualifying. These steps are providing a pre-adverse letter, waiting a reasonable period of time, a pause of five or more days, and sending an adverse action letter. Step three, pre-adverse notice. If the consumer report has derogatory information and you consider it disqualifying, meaning you are rejecting the applicant, terminating an employee, or denying a promotion, then you must continue to follow FCRA by providing a pre-adverse notice. The pre-adverse action notice, letter number one, 
is informing the applicant there is something derogatory and disqualifying on their consumer report and that you may decide not to hire them. Included with the letter, you have to give the applicant a copy of their consumer report and a copy of their summary of rights under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, attachment B in our adverse action kit that comes with your welcome aboard kit. Then you wait, giving them time to respond, to explain the record or records and substantiate the explanation. In the Dollar General case, the claim is that Dollar General violated the FCRA by providing rejected job applicants with outdated and non-compliant notices that they had been screened or notices that came in the mail too late. The defendant, Dollar General, failed to timely provide an FCRA compliant summary of rights form to consumers prior to taking adverse employment action against them based in whole or in part on a consumer report and failed to provide them with a copy of the consumer report itself before making the decision not to hire. The Domino's class action also alleges Domino took adverse employment action against certain individuals based on information contained in the consumer report without providing those individuals notice and a copy of the consumer report in advance. Kmart also settled their lawsuit due to an outdated FCRA summary of rights notices and only sending one adverse action letter and in some instances not sending any letters. So a clear takeaway regarding these lawsuits is to make sure you send out a pre-adverse notice with an update, up-to-date summary of rights. Now this can be said in person or mailed to the applicant. If you are doing in person, make sure you use, you have your applicant or employee signed this receipt. Our next step is another common issue with FCRA compliance and class action lawsuits. Step number four, waiting a reasonable period of time, the pause. The FCRA requires this step in order to give the applicant plenty of opportunity to explain any negative or disqualifying items on the consumer report. This pause can be to the employer's advantage. After spending time, money, and effort recruiting this applicant, the pause gives the applicant an opportunity to explain any adverse information before denying the applicant a job offer. This gives the applicant a fair opportunity to claim a mistake or give their side of the story to explain any derogatory information in order to sway your decision in hiring them. If there was an error in the public record, giving the applicant an opportunity to explain or correct it would be in the employer's best interest. However, if the applicant doesn't respond after the pre pre-adverse notice, letter number one, you can assume the consumer report is correct and then make the decision not to hire. According to an opinion letter from the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, a minimum period of five business days would be reasonable, although an employer may consider a longer period just to be on the safe side. This pause should be the time that would be needed for an applicant to meaningfully review the consumer report and make known to the employer or the CRA any inaccurate or incomplete information in the consumer report. For most clients, questions arise concerning criminal records contained in the consumer report. Setting aside the FCRA requirements for a minute, EEOC guidance now becomes the issue. In conversations I've had with clients, they use this time to do a targeted screen or an individualized assessment of some sort when either considering criminal convictions or recent arrest records. In order to establish an affirmative defense, two things must take place according to the EEOC, a targeted screen and an individualized assessment. Now, adverse action doesn't only apply to criminal records. Other examples where adverse action needs to be followed when considering other types of information contained in the consumer report, such as MVR reports or a motor vehicle report, a person's driving history employment verification, education verification, and credit checks. If the applicant is applying for a job with the requirements of operating a company vehicle or must meet your company's insurance requirements, then an MVR search is prudent. If the consumer report shows that the applicant has multiple traffic infractions to include an accident with 10 or more points or is not insurable and now they will be disqualified, adverse action is required. The same applies for employment verification. The applicant has three previous employers 
who report this person is not eligible for rehire on the consumer report. If you intend to reject this applicant based on this information, then adverse action applies. Take, for example, Walmart. I'm not sure if you heard about the story about their chief spokesman, David Tovar. He was up for promotion, and part of Walmart's company policy, employees must be rescreened when up for promotion. Mr. Tovar was in line to be promoted to a senior vice president position. And during a routine background check, it was discovered that the education component had disqualifying information. He didn't have a college degree. Once the company discovered this issue with the executive's education, they were required to inform him, pre-adverse notice, and allow him to take time to, take time to respond before taking adverse action. Remember, rules apply if you are rejecting the applicant, terminating an employee, or denying a promotion. Several errors could have potentially occurred with the check. The specialist doing the check could have mistyped this person's name. In this particular instance, Tovar is an unusual last name. Uh, the university could have incorrectly filed this person's degree. Human error is always a potential with any type of check. In this particular case, no error occurred, and the executive took the pause to tell his story. And it went something like this. He walked to graduation, learning afterwards he was a few credits short. He received a job offer out of state, and he didn't think an art degree would matter in communications, and you know he could always make the, the credits up later, even though he didn't. To finish the story, he was not fired because of his lack of a degree, but he was not promoted, so Walmart gave him the adverse action notice, informing Mr. Tovar he was denied the promotion. Credit checks. Credit checks have become an issue all in and of themselves. Multiple states and cities have issued specific rules regarding when and under what circumstances they can be run. The city of New York has just recently passed legislation restricting them in most instances. The EEOC was supposed to issue a guidance position back in 2012, but it was never issued. So as a general rule when running a credit check, the overriding principle or standard as it applies with the EEOC would be it has to be job related and consistent with business necessity. When requesting an app, on an applicant in a state without specific requirements. If you are requesting it in a state with specific rules, obviously you must adhere to the state law. Step five, adverse action. Letter number two is your final determination informing the applicant he or she did not get the position. The written notice must contain the CRA's name, address, and phone number along with the statement that the CRA did not make the adverse decision, rather the employer did, and a notice that the applicant or employee has the right to dispute the accuracy or the completeness of the information that the consumer report provided. The applicant has a right to file a dispute with the CRA, and the CRA has, in turn has 30 days to investigate the dispute. If the applicant is disputing the information, the dispute is with the CRA and not the employer. After the first notice is given and the applicant has had a lawyer may to hold the job open for a long period of time. So to clarify, while a sympathetic employer may give the applicant more than five days to get any errors corrected, the FCRA does not require an employer to do so. Most employers find as a practical matter that this provision of law does not impose any undue hardship or burden on them. And generally speaking, based on company needs, this position does not need to be held open. However, as a caveat, I'm going to throw out there, I've heard these make the argument that if, an, if a candidate has a conditional law or has given notice or quit another employer or has moved to accept this position, companies should not be so quick to send the adverse action letter if the candidate is claiming a major error or is filing a dispute with the CRA. Then consideration should be given to hold the position and allow the dispute to play out. Now, I'm not an attorney, so I would recommend that you seek counsel in these situations and stress the importance of having a good relationship with your CRA. Just to reiterate, both letters must be sent with a minimum of five days between the letters in order to be in compliance with the FCRA. 
I also want to clear up any misconceptions of the five-day waiting period to pause. This is not necessarily a dispute. The consumer report could be correct, but the circumstances surrounding the derogatory information may help you as an employer change your mind. A dispute is only when the applicant says there is a mistake on the consumer report or that the information is untrue and files a dispute with the CRA. So let me give you an instance, instance which seems to be a typical staffing company problem. They have a candidate slated to start work on Monday morning, but late Friday afternoon they get a background check with, criminal, with a criminal record or criminal records and, or some other issue with the consumer report. So the recruiter calls the applicant and says, hey, I got your background check results back and there's some issues so you can't start Monday. The applicant will only hear they didn't get the job. It gives the appearance that the staffing agency has denied the applicant a fair shake at obtaining what they applied for. What the recruiter should say is, the background check is still pending or under further move and we'll have to delay your start date. Now, depending on the situation or business necessity, you may have to select another candidate to start on Monday, someone with a clear background check. The first candidate is not entitled to this particular position, but the FCRA does say they are entitled to a notice prior to taking adverse action. So something to consider when making an offer or setting a start date with an applicant is to build in or factor additional time it will take to get your consumer report. If you typically get your consumer report back in two days, add a few more days before this, the start to allow for the pause. I'm going to take a quick minute and talk about the possibility of human error. Now, this was hand pulled this specific record. The record was literally in a book, and the clerk had to transcribe the record and certify the result. After I got the record back, I noticed a look odd. Clerk's office back and requested a recheck of the record. It turned out the the clerk transcribed the wrong record by accident the first time and then had to reissue us a new certified record. Now this clerk probably does hundreds of searches a day without error, but just happened to make an error this time. Now this is not a common everyday occurrence, but errors can and do happen. There are some courts where the court records can only be searched by the clerk then passed on to the court researcher. The court researcher will then have to take the court record and retype it into the consumer report. There can be times when multiple people touch a piece of information before it becomes part of the final consumer report you see. If you or your applicant feels the report is incorrect, contact your CRA to discuss it. When given an option, the more information is better as the population continues to grow, names are becoming more common. If your applicant has a common name, Always include a middle name or middle initial whenever available. This will help decrease the possibility of reporting incorrect information. Now, let's take a look at identity theft. I'm going to give you one of our examples of a horror story. We located criminal records on an applicant and verified these records by full name and date of birth. The client requested we double check the record. The applicant claimed the records did not belong to him. So we went back to the court. We re-verified the court record to include full name, date of birth, address, and social security number. And the social security number is generally not available with most criminal records, but in this instance we're able to get it. This applicant was still adamant these records did not belong to him. The applicant then filed a dispute with us directly. This particular dispute required fingerprints being submitted to the state police to confirm the records. After reviewing the fingerprints, the state was able to determine the records were in fact not his, but belonged to his brother, as we like to call it, his evil twin brother. His brother had used all of his personal information and gave it to the police when he was arrested on several occasions. This applicant was able to get a certified letter stating these records did not belong to him, and this person will also need to petition the court to remove these records as they do not belong to him to prevent this from happening again in the future. And until the records are corrected, he will continue to have this issue every time he applies for a job or has a criminal search run on him. Now I'm going to 
switch gears and talk about lying on the application. I always get questions about this, and it would seem pretty cut and dry. Many employers deem lying as an automatic disqualifier. I would caution you that this is a case-by-case -case situation. It has been speculated that some employers use lying on the application as a means to avoid adverse action. So the applicant said he didn't have a criminal history when asked on the application, but the con consumer report says he does. So he must have lied on the application. And the company does not hire liars. Therefore, they're not going to hire him, not due to the information within the background check, but just on the basis the candidate lied to us. Now, you wouldn't have known about the lie without the consumer report. So the FCRA would still say adverse action would need to be followed in a situation like this. Now I want to take it just a one step further. So let's look at the Walt Disney case in the context of lying on the application. Now this is a hypothetical scenario, but one of the particular allegations in the case was that an expunged record was reported. If this applicant did not admit to the record on his application because it was expunged, would that still constitute lying? And how would he have known it's still being reported in the public record if he, he wasn't given, if you didn't give the applicant his pre-adverse notice? The applicant did not have to disclose his expunged record, and because you saw it, now you think he's lying. As a best practice, if you are basing any information on part from the consumer report, adverse action always should be followed. Adverse action should, should be followed even when the information is not considered negative on its face if you are taking action based on the consumer report. I'm going to go back to credit reports as an example. Your applicant has a perfect payment history on the credit report, but you as an employer are concerned with the level of debt being too high compared to the salary they will be making. This applicant would still be entitled to adverse action if you're not going to hire them based on this information. So let me finish with an example. You're a small company hiring for the position of controller and the expected salary is $75,000. You check all the boxes on the employment profile form, criminal, MVR, education, employment, and credit. The consumer report comes back with no disqualifying information. The person has no criminal record. The MVR report is clear. The education comes back verified. The work history is verified with no issues. The credit report shows a perfect payment history no delinquent accounts, and no bankruptcies. However, the report shows this person has more than $350,000 in debt. Now, you may or may not have concerns with this piece of information, but if you do and you don't want to hire them because of it, then adverse action is required. I believe your hiring process can be made easy with following the five simple steps to ensure fair hiring practices. To review, these five steps are disclosure, authorization, pre-adverse action, waiting a reasonable period of time to pause, and adverse action. Court ruling and guidance surrounding the FCRA are constantly changing, but a good CRA will partner with you, assisting you with your screening process and provide the tools needed in order to comply with the FCRA. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Jane for guidance and best practices. Wow, <clears throat> that was so much information. Thank you so much, John. That was great. Now that you understand the steps to the FCRA, we want to provide you with some guidelines when following these simple steps. And at the risk of repeating ourselves, these steps are very important. So we want to make a big deal about it and make sure that you understand as the employer what is required. So I might say the same thing that John said, make a note of it. <laughs> Here are a few of our best practices. When complying with the FCRA, you must also follow all state, federal, and EEO guidelines. The FCRA is just a bare minimum. There are ban-the-box laws, which are state and then even city-specific. Also, states will have additional rules regarding conviction history and what is allowed to be searched, as well as what can even be considered in the report. Next, if the FCRA says OK, the EEOC might say, no way. Uh, what might be okay according to the FCRA is not always okay with the EEOC. For example, the FCRA will allow you to view a conviction record as far back as it happened. It could have been 25 years ago that you saw this offense. 
the EEOC would cry, a 25-year-old conviction? How relevant can that be? The EEOC wants you to consider the nature and gravity of the offense, the time elapsed since the offense was committed and completion of the sentence, as well as the nature of the position that this applicant applied for. A seven-year search is best practice. Some states will not allow you to see records past seven years. Uh, some you can only see convictions in the last seven years. So to be safe, just ask seven years back. There are major consequences for getting more information than you need to in order to make the decision about your applicant. Accuracy is everything. The FCRA requires a CRA give the most accurate information available. Many resellers don't always verify the information they report. So don't be afraid to ask your CRA how they check the quality of their searches. Does your applicant have a common name? Well, how does your CRA confirm that the applicant is who they say they are? How do they confirm the records they find? Where do they get the information from? Some CRAs buy information in bulk, like from a state repository, and package it up as an instant check. But this information is not up to date, and they're still allowed to sell it if it's within 30 days of their purchase. What your CRA should be doing to find the most accurate records is searching the individual counties. But of course, that takes time, money, and resources. If you're interested, send me an email and I'll send you a recent case study we did against a major competitor where we found felony and misdemeanor hits on 53% of their employees. The manufacturing company's previous provider gave an all clear allowing these criminals to be hired instead of being screened out. These felonies included assault with a dangerous weapon, forgery, conspiracy conversion, controlled substance abuse. Do you want a drug dealer on your payroll? Not all background checks are the same. Something to remember, and John mentioned this in the beginning of the presentation, is the FCRA is a federal consumer protection statute. It was to protect you as the consumer. So when there's something in question, the laws will always benefit the applicant. It was created with the applicant's best interest in mind. Now, regarding disclosure and authorization, make sure these releases are not in your application. The notices need to be clear and conspicuous. Let it be known that you're running a background check on the person. They're expecting it. Almost all employers run background checks of some type or another. Tell the applicant up front and don't hide it. When they know you're running one, they'll be more likely to tell you what you're going to see on that consumer report. As common practice, the disclosure should be given first, prior to the authorization. If you give the authorization first, it's like, I'm going to authorize you to run a background check on me. Oh, but then you're going to inform me that a background check is going to be run. Just makes sense if you give disclosure, then authorization. Also, keep the documents separate. Have a stand-alone documents. I mean, why risk it? There's an argument about if it's in its own box on the page or if the authorization and disclosure can be on the same page. Make it easy on yourself. Take any question out of it. I mean, why place yourself in a position of vulnerability and compromise? If you're using our forms, it's not a problem. And according to the FCRA, the disclosure must be separate from any other document if you're putting any additional information on the form. So no release with the disclosure. Leave it off. Maybe put it in the application. And this can be a release of liability or a confirmation of at-will employment. Anything like that, make it on a different form. Now, a few action steps. These are things that you can do right away to protect your company and avoid the lawsuits. First off, have all of your documentation you're using um, checked by your legal team to ensure FCRA compliance. Attorney fees, yes, can be expensive, but they cost a lot less than an award of statutory damages between $100 and $1,000 per candidate for each FCR violation. And this is a candidate, so it could be someone that you hired and it also could be someone that you rejected. Plus, on top of the uh, statutory damages, you're also going to be paying injunctive relief, punitive damages, civil penalties, uh, the 
reasonable costs of a lawsuit, and then all of those attorney fees again. So protect yourself and your company. We have Taft Law, one of the oldest and most respected employment law firms in the country, approve all of our forms for compliance. We also have partners like Taft, as well as Dinsmore, who work nationwide that we can recommend to help you review your forms and policies, all of your practices, and your paperwork. Next, you want to review all of the documents provided to you by your CRA when you signed on with them. Make sure that you're following their guidance and recommendations. If it's been a few years, talk to them again. Make sure that you have the latest forms to use. It should be a partnership. You and your CRA are in it together, screening together. Also, make sure that you keep all of your documents on hand. Um, HR Profile will recommend keeping your paperwork seven years if you hired the applicant, five years if you didn't. Now, if you're using your own application, give the disclosure form first. Here are your rights if you sign the authorization and the disclosure should be on its own page. Also, make sure that you're reviewing your ad adverse action process. If you disqualify a candidate based on the background check or consumer report, make sure you are sending a pre-adverse action notice with the consumer report and a summary of your rights before the decision is made. Now, a few more things just specifically on adverse action. Make sure that when you're sending the pre-adverse notice, Include the consumer report and an updated copy of your rights under the FCRA. Also, make sure that you are taking that pause, waiting five days as a minimum before sending the final adverse action notice. Lastly, make sure that the wording on your disclosure authorization are correct. West and Panera had recent lawsuits claiming that they failed to use the term consumer report. Okay, so now we want to make sure that when you're choosing a CRA, do some research. Search lawsuits on CRAs. Make sure the company you choose has never had a lawsuit filed against them. When you're buying a car, you do some research as to how many miles per gallon it gets, what the resale value is, and you even take it for a test drive. Not all background checks are the same. Not all background check companies are the same either. So do your research and compare. We set up trials with prospective customers to help them evaluate their current provider against the information that we provide, giving them a test drive. Also, don't leave it just to your human resource department. Bring together the management teams and hiring managers to make sure that your company understands the background check process. The HR department, operations, procurement, security, and IT departments all have different but important roles in the process. Make sure everyone is on the same page and that there's coordination within the company. This will help you tremendously in all areas of hiring, not just with FCRA compliance. Also, um, employers should consider how to best record personnel decisions. Whether you're hiring or firing the applicant, make sure that you document the reason the applicant was rejected. It could have been the background check, sure, but it could also be due to a poor interview failure to provide requested follow-up information, or a drug test failure. Make notes of it, and be specific. Also, a quick FYI, make sure the notes that you're taking are not discriminatory. Write objective notes only. And lastly, record everything. Write it down in your policy and have it documented. Note the reason why you're doing the background check. What checks are required for what position? what qualifies as disqualifying. Have clear guidelines and indicators of job necessity. Note where the background checks are kept and how they should be thrown out or shredded. If it's written down in the policy, it makes it easy for someone else to follow and it leaves a lot less room for interpretation and error. Now, we could go on and on, but hopefully this helps guide you on the path to legal and compliant hiring through the FCRA. Last time, just to wrap up, the five steps of the FCRA are disclosure, giving clear notice, authorization, obtaining a signed release, pre-adverse notice, letter number one, you found something on the record, 
sent with the consumer report and a summary of your rights, the pause or waiting period, a minimum of five days, and adverse action. Letter number two, we've decided not to hire. Now we have some time for questions, so be sure to type them into the QA field and we'll answer as many as we can in the time that remains. And a quick reminder before we answer any questions, I just want you to know that we are not attorneys and our answers cannot be considered as legal advice. So we do have a lot of questions here. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, the first one is, uh, why are we required to send out two letters? Well, I, I get that question a lot. And unfortunately, the, the legislature, when uh, they enacted this law, clearly intended to, to have a two-notice step um, and the ability for the applicant to either correct or make a statement prior to uh, the final notice. And uh, the whole reason because of the five days is that the, the FCRA only says that you have to wait a reasonable amount of time. Um, and so that's why we use the opinion letter uh, by the FTC as the five days, because there has, have been uh, court rulings that have indicated that four days could be considered unreasonable. So that is the reason why you have to send both notices and you have to wait a reasonable period of time. Another question, can we put the important disclosure form and the employment profile form in the same packet with our application? Yes. Um, it, it generally, the, the issue becomes when um, you're using your own type of disclosure and authorization form. And part of the, the law, as far as when it comes to authorizations, there's not specific requirements. So you can have an authorization and disclosure on the same page. But if you do, that's it. You can't have any other information on that particular page. Um, so as a best practice, it's, it's just better to have the standalone disclosure. Um, and when you do have your authorization, if you have your authorization on a separate page, you, you can have any other language included in that because there is no specific rule what can be in the authorization. Here's another question that's kind of on the same lines as that. So the applicant should complete the disclosure at the time of filling out the application and not at the time of completing the pre-employment profile form? Well, I mean, that kind of goes back to the packet question. Um, you, in a real, you know, in an ideal world, you, you'd have the applicant complete the application, and then they see the disclosure saying, oh, by the way, if, if we do the background check, we are going to do a background check, and here are your rights, and then your employment profile is giving authorization. Um, you know, if the applicant moves the paperwork around, you're still good if you're using our forms. So that is not an issue. Okay, perfect. Um, now, you had mentioned the FTC and the CFPB. Who are they? Who are they? Well, <laughs> uh, the FTC at one point had the sole regulatory enforcement uh, regulation over the FCRA. But... Uh, the, the regulatory authority has been passed on to the CFPB um, in 2010 with the passing of the Frank Dodd Act. And so um, if you know anything about our, our current legis or Congress, uh, the, that agency has had some specific issues and uh, trials. Um, and so they are a new agency, and they're truly in their infancy. And so um, the reason why they haven't uh, issued any new regulation is because they have just assumed the regulatory authority, and pretty much everything that the FTC has done up to this period, they have just now said that's their rule, and they haven't done anything else with it. Okay. Uh, now, on the offer letter, should the start date say expected start date? Um, to allow for that pause or the... Well, that is, um, that would be more up to how your, your company wants to, to, to deal with that issue. Um, but as, as far as the concern about the issue with offer letters is generally offer letters, 
would be given after you've already done the, the background check. Um, but there, there's no requirements. There are no rules on what you have to do and how you do it. How far back in years can the checks go? Well, the reason why I used the $75,000 uh, money requirement in my last example with the controller is because that is one of the exceptions uh, of the FCRA. Um, so if a person is making, is reasonably thinking that they will make or make more than $75,000, the FCRA pretty much says you can look at criminal histories and convictions indefinitely. Now, there are some states that you have to meet or exceed that in order to, to, to see that information about even convictions. And do the years vary based on whether it's an NBR check or a criminal check or a credit check? No. Uh, the the, the seven-year rule applies unless, uh, I'll give you a perfect example, California changed their driver's license law to say you can look back 10 years. Um, and that would be perfectly acceptable to see a 10-year driving history even though, so one of the issues that can come up is you can see on their driving record they had a DUI eight years ago, but if you looked in the criminal record, you don't, it wouldn't show up. But that is, every state's different and there's always different rules. So is the time state or federally regulated? Oh, I'm sorry, just can you repeat that question one more time? Like the years that you're allowed to see the time, is that state regulated or is it federally regulated? Well, think about, the way to look at this is you have a federal rule and then the state can't supersede that rule but they can make it they can give more protections in lieu of what the federal standard is if that I hope that it clarifies your, <laughs> your answer or clarifies your question um, what do we do if we don't hear back from a ca candidate do we need to do anything um, no, as long as you've, you've sent both letters um, and you waited the five days, um, no, there's nothing further needs to be done. Is there anything wrong if I give the authorization first? Um, no, it, 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 the order is, is not much uh, to be worried about. Um, and, and generally when we're talking about the FCRA claims, it's because it's within an application. When I say within an application, it's literally like page three of the application. So when you're using our forms, like I said, that's not the same as the employment application, so. Okay. Which forms should be filed standalone? Do we need to keep the background check separate from their employee file? Um, you, you should have, um, you should just have a policy in place on which uh, paperwork you're, well, obviously if you're, you're, if you're not hiring this person, it wouldn't be an employee file. <laughs> so, Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to point out the obvious there, but um, um, I believe that um, you can keep uh, the information in the personnel file. Okay. Now, when sending a copy of the consumer report, does the entire report need to be sent? or just the portion that contains the disqualifying information? Uh, no, you have to send the entire consumer report. Okay. Um, for example, HR profile allows us to generate only a PDF of the criminal portion. Is it okay just to send that portion? If, if that's the only part of the consumer report you're using, yes. If you're, good at, if, if you're using that piece of the consumer report to, to basis, uh, your, your disqualifying information, yes. Okay. Uh, I often give the offer letter, get an acceptance, then do the background check. Is this the wrong order? No, th there's, that's, there is no specific order in which you have to do this. Um, the, the issue that I've heard attorneys make is if there is an offer, um, and even federal agencies do conditional offers before they even do a background check. So um, that is not an issue um, in and of itself. It's just you got to make sure you're doing the, the steps properly about waiting the, the, the five days if you're wanting to disqualify somebody. Okay. 
And then this is the last question that we have, um, and it is, so if an applicant admits to a DUI, but I do not find evidence of such on the criminal search, should it be listed in the background check? So they admitted to it, but it didn't come up on the criminal report. Um, now, there could be all kinds of reasons why that happened. Um, and and uh, some of the reasons could be that, and we see this where people will actually have their records expunged, but yet still admit to stuff that we can't report or can't be found. Uh, and that could be one of the issues why that happens. Um, or they're just, um, they're not clear or they're, you're, they're, they're, it's just an area where it wasn't searched properly. So it depends on your, your background screening company making sure you, they checked all available areas. Um, as far as we, we do have applicants, I've seen them come across about just saying they have a DUI, but they didn't say where they had it, and sometimes that could be the issue. Mm -hmm. Or depending on whether it's what state it's in, because in some states a DUI is a driving offense, so unless you check the MVR record, it's not going to show up. Or if it's uh, considered as a misdemeanor or an immediate felony, then those would be showing up. Right, um, and, and you're correct about that. Um, in some states, uh, DUIs are considered infractions, and uh, some states, uh, DUIs are not contained in the, the criminal courts, so it does depend on the state as well. Okay, and then another question along with that one, she asks, but can I still list it? Should it be listed in the background check? As far as, yes, if, if, if an applicant admits to something, um, the CRA should uh, find that information. Now, they could be restricted, restricted by the, the years of limitation on that. If someone lists a DUI in 1978, <laughs> you may not be able to find it. Okay. Uh, another question just came in. Uh, arrest being separate from conviction, must you separate it in taking adverse action? No, because um, when we talk about taking adverse action in the consumer report, it's any information in that consumer report that you are going to base your information on. And But now that's the difference between FCRA and EEOC. Just because you get to see it in says the FCRA, doesn't mean you should be using that information unless you're following uh, the guidance of the EEOC. So. All right, perfect. Okay, so that are, those are all of the questions that have been asked. Again, if you do have additional questions that you would like, uh, our contact information, email is the best way to get a hold of us, but you can always also call us at 800-969-4300. Um, and thank you for joining HR Profile, Conquering the FCRA. Uh, please feel free to contact us if you do have additional questions that we weren't able to cover today. Also, be sure to join us July 15th to talk about assessment testing. What's the best way to hire? Employment screening and assessments. Know which applicants will succeed. Knowing as much information as you can about an applicant before you hire them puts the ball in your court. So join Paul Nolan, he's the president of Personnel Profiles, and he'll be describing the different types of assessments available and what you can learn about your applicants before you decide to hire them. Uh, following today's webinar, you will receive a copy of the presentation, your HRCI hour certificate, and a short follow-up survey. We appreciate you being here and look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you so much.